Are you looking at the real Liu Xin or an AI-generated one? Well, this time it is real, but who knows in the near future. Now, in the past week, one name has been on the lips of everyone, Sora, a text-to-video tool which generated the one-minute video of that woman walking down a nighttime street in Tokyo. The images unveiled by OpenAI, the San Francisco startup company which also launched ChatGPT at the end of 2022, sent instant shockwaves around the world. While the inception of Sora excites many, the question looms for many more. What kind of uncertainty will the technology bring to our future? Autonomous robots and AI were already considered a much heightened risk for citizens around the world last year, according to a risk perception survey released recently. Authorities around the world, including in China, the US, the European Union, have been racing to try to mitigate the risks with regulation. So what kind of action is needed to keep Sora and its counterparts a force for good? What stands in the way of international collaboration given the current geopolitical tensions? Can we overcome the differences. I'm pleased to be joined from Beijing by Zheng Yi, professor at the Institute of uh, Automation at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He's also a member of the UN Advisory Body on AI. I'm also joined from Hong Kong by Stephen Hoffman, CEO and Chairman of and Chairman of Founder Space and author of the book Make Elephants Fly. Gentlemen, welcome to the point. And elephants are flying at this moment. <laughs> so. Um, now, the, the thing is, right, we all looked at uh, these videos generated by Sora and go, wow. I mean, 10 months ago, the difference was huge. We were looking at uh, uh, Will Smith, gen AI-generated Will Smith eating spaghetti, and everybody was laughing off from their chair. And now we're looking at AI that is probably realer than reality. Now, in terms of regulation, which is my focus, what kind of specific challenge is such revolutionary te technology posing? To regulators, Professor Zeng. Uh, I wanted to echo what you said that I, as a technique, both technical and governance researchers of AI, I will never have an interest to talk to a fake Liu Xin, a digital Liu Xin. <laughs> this is a real one, because I promise we you. have humanities uh, underlying that. Well, on the other side, we do see the you know the the, the progress of. Uh, of AI, now it can generate very smooth uh, digital uh, videos. Well, the real challenge now is that now you cannot say seeing is believing. What you see is probably not true. Mm. Uh, and in most cases, it might be fake. So this, this is the real challenge. So in this way, actually, the good part is that it can be used you know, to digital uh, media, to entertainment. That is the good part, uh, to reduce, to reduce uh, the, the human uh, what human has to do and to assist human beings. Well, the downside is really that uh, for, for the global trust um, and, and many of the issues uh, related to uh, you know, safety uh, issues, that, that is the real challenge. It has challenge to digital forensics. It has to challenges to you know, the police, so um, to creating uh, fake information and also to create fake information during uh, global or national votes. So we really need uh, you know, both the national governance and also the international governance yeah. for uh, video, both video and, and uh, textual mm -hmm. generative AI. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, what are the major concerns in your part of the world? I mean, in, in the United States, in Western countries, developed countries. Do you think there are major differences in this regard in terms of the perceived risks, you know, that can be uh, brought about with this uh, technological uh, progress? Yes. So in Silicon Valley, people are very bullish on AI. I mean, people in general believe that AI is the future, and the U.S. government will not put the brakes on the development of artificial intelligence because everyone is afraid of falling behind. So the risks, though, are enormous. So we, right now, with artificial intelligence, you can create video that is indistinguishable from real video. And this will only get better. Now, these videos still have a few telltale signs mm -hmm. that it's not real. If you look very closely, most people won't look closely. But if you do, you can tell. But in the future, though, even those small signs will go away. 
So the people are worried in a number of areas. Number one, it's going to put a lot of people out of work. I mean, think of how many people work in creating videos, creating content, the whole oh, hosting talk industry. shows. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, all that can be done now with simply typing in keywords and the videos are absolutely amazing. I mean, they, they come out fully edited with hammer angles and everything else, and they're going to be able to layer on music and voice. So where we're headed, there'll be an impact on jobs. There will be an impact on, in, in the West, we're very concerned with democratic elections and what that means in the West. And if you can simulate uh, anything, you know, campaign things, if you can put out negative videos about a political candidate right before an election, Who's to stop you? And these videos can go viral. Mm. And then fraud. Imagine your relative calling you up with your voice, maybe their image, and saying, I'm in dire trouble. I need money. Send me money. But you yeah. cannot tell the voice or the image from your mother, your father. Yeah. And so you wire them money. Okay. There are many, many scenarios sure, like sure. that. Um, it seems that some of the risks are uh, similar to the ones that are perceived here in China, Professor Zeng. Um, China, of course, has different sets of challenges, I understand. But I was just, you know, browsing through the video channels and I saw a AI, apparently AI-generated woman talking about, you know, giving a lesson on history. Um, Apparently, she is a virtual figure, but it was not marked that it was AI. And people without the kind of literacy or basic ability to tell the difference are simply unable to tell, let alone the older generation who don't have the kind of technology savviness. For instance, my parents, they could well treat this person as a real person and really buy into that. What kind of specific challenges is China faced with in terms of regulating AI? Is China going to put some sort of a break on the development or application of, of AI te technologies? I think both uh, the, the US and China has very uh, similar challenges in uh, the in generative AIs. The, the examples actually that you gave, uh, similarly, they, they happened uh, everywhere in the in the world. So, but what China has done is really on the regulation of generative AI that the China Cyberspace Administration of China released their uh, regulation on generative AI. Something which is relevant to your example is that now in China, when you create generative AI videos, you have to market uh, based on artificial intelligence, based on generative AI. Uh, otherwise, you know, th these uh, ministers will have uh, regulation, uh, regulative steps for you. So I think that's really uh, essential, both from the government side and also from the developer and also the industry side, that we need to do self-regulation. We need to uh, keep these, uh, you know, generations to be marked uh, very explicitly. We don't, we, we cannot mislead the general public yeah. uh, well, in that way. So I yeah. think that is really Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, aside from these common uh, challenges, it is interesting because Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi talked about China's wish to have a, an UN body, UN institution set up in terms of AI governance. And I have not heard uh, other countries, especially major countries such as the United States or, or European countries, echo this idea. Why does China particularly want that? And um, What's the difference between an AI governance body under the UN and the UN um, advisory body, high-level advisory body to which you are a member, Professor Zeng? The, the, uh, actually, the challenge of AI is everywhere. Well, as you can see, now we have some domestic regulations and institutions. We have some regional uh, networks. But actually, what really matters is that how can we deal with this in a global manner? What is the interoperability among these regional networks and also these different c countries? For that, we need a global coordination mechanism. So we need a tracked record who should be believed to do, you know, the 
the global uh, coordination uh, of technology of this of this society and also of AI. So in, in that case, I think uh, the Chinese government believe that the UN system is the right place to do the global coordination. N not really to say that the UN system should take care of everything, but the role of the UN system on AI should coordinate to coordinate the regional networks in a more effective way and, not re and also to coordinate member states on interoperabilities, on exchanges, uh, on sharing of risk and, and dealing with risks uh, all together. So I think by that, it cannot be solved by regional networks. So th that is the role mm -hmm. uh, for UN. So yeah. I, and I, the track record uh, means uh, the Chinese government uh, is based in to, to support uh, the UN system. Yeah. Yes. Um, Professor Hoffman, it seems that uh, some other countries do not necessarily um, share the idea or are not very excited about it at this stage. We uh, know that there was a G7 meeting in Hiroshima last year where G7 countries reached some kind of a comprehensive you know, framework about AI governance. Um, is there this kind of idea that developed countries are going to do their job in terms of AI governance uh, with their values and developing countries doing a different you know, system? Are we going to see a, a, an, another race for dominance potentially here? So what we're seeing now is there's a lot of talk about governance and I personally feel a global governance is a very important thing. But in reality, uh, countries, the countries that are ahead in AI are not going to slow down because the countries that are leading the way see it to their greatest advantage to have the most powerful AI because if they have the most powerful AI in the world, then even if there's a cyber attack or there's other disruptions, they will be in a position to use that AI to thwart those attacks. But if they dial back the development, then they risk somebody else promising. So, so they, are, they are producing something that can be weaponized and they want to weaponize that technology to use against that weapon. <laughs> this is crazy. Well, imagine this, yes. So people are afraid, right? Because we know AGI is coming and that and super intelligence is coming. And at that point, AI will be so powerful that literally the ones who control it control everything. So, that, so they want to make sure they're first to that end goal. Yeah, but, but the United the States. Way, yeah, sorry, I'm running out of money. The United States is keen on talking to China in terms of AI, which is a good thing, right? The two leaders agree to that and they will have they have already started engagement. What is the importance of that and what should be really the focus here? Professor Hoffman, really quickly, please. I think it's really important to have this dialogue because at the root of it is fear and distrust. We need to overcome that if we're going to form any sort of cooperative framework. Okay. And uh, Professor Zheng, what is China and the United States, what are China and the United States going to talk about, going to focus on in terms of AI governance? Keep it in 20 seconds, please. If for both countries, if one of the countries does not really develop AI in a safe way, it will be very dangerous to the other side. So this is why both the US and China has to talk to each other to remove all the AI safety issues altogether and to build a joint safety framework so okay. that it benefits for all, all humanity. Right. Um, quickly, yes or no, Stephen, shall I have a digital mini me? You will have to in the future, unavoidable. <laughs> Shall I do it fast enough now then? You should get ahead of the game. Oh my goodness, let me think about it. Many thanks, Stephen um, Hoffman, founder, CEO of uh, Founder Space and uh, Professor Zheng Yi from the UN High Advisory Body on AI. With that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Lushin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Lushin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for joining us. You've got The Point. <laughs>